So before I came on stage, I was in the back and I was listening to the speakers that came before me. And I couldn't help but notice a bit of a, a trend and a theme in, in what I was hearing. And in a word, that trend is revolution. We've heard people talk today about social kinds of revolution. We've heard people talking about political kinds of revolution. We've even heard people talking about technology kinds of revolution. And I want to change gears here a little bit because I want to talk about a revolution that did not happen. And the story gets a little bit weird and surprising when you consider that this is a, a revolution that I think that most of us were hoping for. And I think that it's a revolution that in our heart of hearts, most of us thought would have been here by now. But when the chips were down, it just didn't seem to materialize. Specifically, I'm talking about a revolution in energy technologies and climate change. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that there's already a lot of great material out there already, a lot of it in TED and TEDx types of venues, about this topic area. And if you kind of look at the broad sweep of what's out there, I think most of it falls into one of two buckets. First of all, you've got people who are making the case for change. And those people are typically pointing out that the population of the world is growing. They're talking about how uh, developing nations are indeed developing. And as a consequence of that, per capita, those folks are using more and more energy as the years roll on. Um, they'll show you maps with shrinking polar ice caps. You're going to see photos with uh, rising ocean levels and pictures of distressed habitat as a consequence of climate change. There's so many rich contributions already out there. Uh, among the more famous of these, of course, is Al Gore's work in this, this area. I heard recently, I heard Al Gore say in an interview that he, that famous presentation that we've all seen of his, he has delivered that more than 2,000 times. So I'm going to go on a limb and say that we get it. The verdict is in. I think that most of the homework on that front is done. And that brings me to the second bucket, the second theme of stuff that's already out there. And these people are talking about the constituent technologies that potentially could be brought to bear on this problem space and make a big, a big dent in the problem. And they include lots of great ideas like carbon capture and sequestration, next generation nuclear, solar, wind, batteries. There's so many great ideas out there about how we potentially could solve this problem. If you're in the market for a high-level overview of what those options are and how they might fit together, I would recommend personally, uh, Bill Gates has a TED Talk called Innovating to Zero, well worth your while. But I guess the fact that there's these dozens of contributions that are out there already, it kind of underlines another inconvenient truth. And that is that this discussion has been rolling along for years. How long? Unfortunately, last year we had a rather unfortunate anniversary. Usually I love birthdays and anniversaries, but I'm not a fan of this one. Last year was the 20th anniversary of the Rio Summit, also known to some as the Earth Summit. And in 1992, for those of you who are old enough to remember it, in 1992, 172 countries got together in Rio. And there was a few agenda items that they wanted to explore and talk about in that meeting. But one was much higher in profile than the others, and that was climate change. And I think we can be honest, there's not a lot these days that 172 countries can agree on about anything. But for one beautiful moment in 1992, that's exactly what happened. And they didn't work out all the specifics and all the mechanics of how they were going to solve it, but they put a stake in the ground and they said, this has to stop. We've got to do better. And here's what they were responding to. Here's what the energy mix of the world looked like in 1992. And you can see from this figure behind me here that most of the heavy lifting happened with fossil fuels. Specifically, I'm talking about coal, oil, and natural gas. And for good measure, a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of hydroelectric. And if you squint really hard, you might be able to make out a little sliver labeled renewables. But the brutal truth is that at that time, renewables ran at a zero. So there it was. They had put a stake in the ground. We had an unprecedented amount of political momentum for change. And if you were like me, then you were blown away by what happened next. Because what happened next was practically nothing. 
fossil fuels overwhelmingly continue to be the energy source of choice around the world, and that energy, the renewables technology explosion that we were all hoping for and wanting never showed up. You could be excused, you would be well within your rights to be a little angry and confused. How could this have come to pass? They promised us change, what happened? There's a few possible storylines here. One, maybe the steely resolve of those 172 delegates back in 92. Maybe that was a little less steely than we thought. Maybe they were a little less sincere than we thought they were being at that time. But I don't think that's the most likely explanation because the conversation has continued and it's gathered momentum and it's, it's still going on. So I, I don't think that they were bargaining in bad faith back then. Instead, I think that we were just missing a piece of the puzzle. I think that there was some force, some market dynamics, something that we neglected or that we didn't understand. And that was getting in the way between us and where we want to go. I have the benefit of having a, I've got a very strange career path. Uh, and it's almost hard to explain how I got to the job that I'm doing now. It's been a little bit nonlinear and odd but it's kind of helpful in this particular circumstance because of this. In my quirky career, I had a front row seat at a technolo technological revolution that did happen and that did succeed, and I've also had a front row seat in a technological re revolution that didn't happen very well, and I couldn't get off the ground. And by holding them up side by side and comparing and looking at the differences, I think that that might shed a useful amount of light on what's going on here. And that storytelling takes me to this place. I had the amazing luck to be a graduate student at MIT in the late 1990s. And MIT is a mostly technical university in the United States. And the dot-com revolution, I mean, that was going on in lots of places around the world. Of course it was. But there were a few epicenters where a lot of the big technical breakthroughs were happening. And MIT was on that list. But what was kind of interesting about that was it wasn't all about the technology at that time. In tandem to that discussion, people were talking about new business models and new ways of, of doing everything. And nothing, no nook and cranny in the economy was exempt from this discussion. How do you buy books? That was getting looked at again. How do you have a quality conversation and share data between you and your personal physician? How do you buy dog food over the internet? All of this stuff was being re-examined, rethought, redesigned. And then as I was getting to the end of that, that graduate program, I had to start making some choices. What am I going to do with my life? And a lot of my classmates, they were taking jobs at some of these dot-com startups, and, uh, or some of them were working in consulting capacities that were aiding and abetting the dot-com revolution. But a lot, that was where a lot, the, the center of gravity was for job-seeking people at that age. And I had to make a choice. Having prayed at this altar of high tech for a few years, what was I going to do with my life? Well, here's what I came up with. I was uh, working on an oil and gas platform in the middle of the North Sea, somewhere between Scotland and Norway. And uh, I'm not really sure why I went there and did that. Maybe it was some Hemingway-esque pursuit of adventure. I'm not sure. I'll tell you what, if you are searching for adventure, I think any job where you have to take a helicopter to get to work, that takes that box. That's, um, and... Uh, the rumors are true, you know, we, the 30 foot swells when the weather would get ugly, uh, and all the haggis you can eat every Sunday, so fantastic. And very colorful personalities out there, wonderful people. I did that job very happily, I have no regrets, it was wonderful, did it for a few years. And then I got this call that it was time MIT was having a class reunion. I hadn't seen those folks in years, wanted to catch up, so I definitely made a point of getting over there. Now. Two important personal observations fell into place for me when I went back to the reunion. One, having worked in an environment like that for the last few years, at the reunion, I know I knew way more dirty jokes than anybody else there. And I have not been invited to a reunion since. I'm not sure if there's a connection. There may be. But the other important observation was that I realized from those discussions that the industry that I was working in was fundamentally different in some pretty important ways to what was happening in those other people's industries. Specifically, 
my industry seemed to have a much slower rate of technological evolution. Not a little bit different, profoundly different. Very promising technologies that were always going to make it in the upstream oil and gas industry can still take upwards of 20 or 30 years sometimes to get traction in the industry and get absorbed into the industry. And then after I left the oil patch and started researching the, en the energy industry more broadly at university, I came to discover that this wasn't just an oil and gas thing. That in fact, that this was kind of a structural issue that seemed to affect the en energy industry overall, whether we're talking about nuclear or coal or hydroelectric transmission or oil and gas, it didn't seem to matter. The subtleties are a bit different from one of these in sub -industry industries to the next, but overall, they, they also have some similarities here that make this true. One is that the, the energy industry is very complex and highly interconnected. And the capital investments that go into that industry are massive. And people make those investments intending for those assets to be there for decades. And you take all these ingredients and you mash them together and you've got yourself a recipe for industries that don't change very quickly and that don't absorb technology very readily. And here's why this matters. This matters because of how technological revolutions tend to unfold. Sometimes it's an incumbent in an industry that has that breakthrough revolutionary idea, sometimes. But more often, it's an entrepreneur. More often, it's a small, sprightly company with a fresh perspective, a fire in its belly. And they come up with that revolutionary idea that turns an industry upside down and shakes it all over the place. And things are never the same after that. Time is an important variable for entrepreneurs of every stripe, no matter what industry we're talking about. But time is an especially important variable for entrepreneurs in the energy tech space. And there's two major reasons for that. The first is that our traditional methods for financing and getting funding to those great ideas, like venture capital, those are rather ill-suited and ill-fitting in the energy tech space. Because venture capitalists, not all of them, but most of them, don't want to wait 20 or 30 years to get that payout. And as a consequence, a lot of them just shy away from that, that investment space altogether. The second reason is that even if you are lucky enough to get that first dollop of money, now you've got the job of trying to stay alive for 20 or 30 years while your idea catches on in this slow clock speed environment. And what normally would look like very pedestrian expenses, like making payroll, keeping the lights on, you stretch that out for over 30 years or so, and you've got a problem because there's while your technology hasn't caught on yet, you're finding it very hard to keep, there's, there's no money coming in the front door, and it's tough to stay alive. And as a consequence of those two structural reasons, energy technology entrepreneurs have had a pretty hard go. And the failure rate has been uncommonly high. So here's the punchline. Here's the nub of what I'm trying to say to you today. It was very unlikely that there was ever going to be a dot-com style revolution in the, tech, in the energy technology space. That industry simply isn't hardwired in a way that lends itself to that. And I'm not the only one to be thinking like this. Ramana Nanda at Harvard Business School, David Rotman at MIT Technology Review, they've been looking at different data, but they've landed on a very similar type of conclusion. So here's what I think needs to happen. We need to rethink and we need to do a fundamental reboot on the business models that underpin these great energy technology concepts. We need to disabuse ourselves of the idea that we've got to push aside all of the incumbents and throw away all of the trillions of dollars in infrastructure that's already there. And instead, we need to come up with fresh government policies and approaches that might make it possible for these energy entrepreneurs to work with incumbents and for them to somehow plug in to all that infrastructure that's already out there. And in doing that, we buy these promising ideas a little more time to maybe get the traction and the absorption that they need and that they deserve. What I've talked about here is just one piece of a huge sprawling puzzle, and I get that. 
And I'm not discounting the importance of all those other pieces. But I think that this is one part of the puzzle that was sorely missing. Folks, I think we can all agree that the 20th anniversary of the Rio summit was a bit of a downer, a bit of a letdown. But I really feel that if we can get this right, that is, if we can nail it with the business models that underpin these exciting energy technology concepts, if we can get that right, and I believe that we can, then I've got a hunch that the 40th anniversary of the Rio summit is going to be one hell of a party. Thank you. Thank you.